everybody. I am glad to be here with you this morning. Are you glad to be here? Awesome. So welcome to our message time sponsored by BuzzFeed, right? Uh, kind of seems that way. Um, actually, I suppose in some ways this message could have been a part of a day one series that we just finished uh, because the things that we'll talk about uh, here were either established or come about as a result of day one of the formation of the church. Uh, but the reason why this gets its own message is because I think some of the 10 things every church must do, they don't all happen in one day. And like a lot of components of following Christ, some of these take a while to establish and foster. Not to mention, if it was possible to do all of these uh, things in one day, and you did do all 10 of these things in one day, you would be exhausted. You would need at least 10 weeks to recover. Uh, Also, I think that the 10 things have broader implications. And when we talk about some of the items on the list, this may have more of an institutional component or an instructional feel. So, uh, today's message maybe is part of a larger series, but enough hype and defining parameters, let's get right into it. Um, At the end of almost every message, I offer to assist with next steps for those who have just accepted Christ or for those who request it. I ask people to contact me in person or via email and just see if there's something we can do to kind of point them in the right direction. Now, of course, uh, new steps, uh, next steps, aren't exclusively reserved for the new Christ follower. Many long-term Christ followers will find themselves at a point asking, what's next? And so maybe some of the topics that we're going to talk about will help point you in the right direction, if that's you right now. But when I was doing youth and young adults ministry, and somebody would invite Jesus to be the Lord of their life, I would always give them three things they should do as next steps, all of which will be on this list in one way or another. Only three things. And they were very simple things. I'd say start a prayer life, pick a gospel and read it, and keep coming to church or youth group. And we'll talk about the whys behind all of those and more when we get to those sections, but three things, only three. And they all sound deceptively simple, right? It's almost too easy. Of course, it begs the question, if there's 10 things that every church member must do, why did you only give those three things to new followers? And the answer is because Christianity is like Rocket League. There's a lot of Rocket League players in here, I feel that. (laughs) Going after an untapped demo here. Rocket League, for those of you who don't know, is a video game released in 2015. It is still going strong in 2022. It is essentially indoor soccer played with rocket-powered cars. It sold 10.5 million copies before it went free to play. As of this date, over 60 million accounts have signed in to play Rocket League. In 2020, the game set a record with over a million concurrent players playing online at the same time. Now, Rocket League is deceptively simple. The object is simple. Put the giant soccer ball in your opponent's goal. Keep the giant soccer ball out of your own goal. Games are timed for five minutes. Whoever scores the most goals wins. And it's great fun. When you first start playing, you're just kind of learning the field and learning how to drive your car and figure your way out around and, you know, how to hit the ball. Sometimes you'll play whole games without hitting the ball when you first start playing and kind of bumping into each other, making a mess out of things, just figuring out how to drive around. And, you know, maybe you get lucky, maybe you hit the ball off the wall, you get an assist to another player, you feel good about it. But that's Rocket League when you first start out. Just a lot of fun, people bumping into each other, right? And then, something happens. Somebody shows up on the field that does something like this. That's nasty. Nasty. Or this. Yeah. And that's when you realize that there is a lot more to this game than maybe you thought there was at first. A lot more nuance. There are levels, levels of knowledge, levels of experience. But here's the thing. If you were just learning the game 
And somebody was giving you instructions about more complicated maneuvers. All right, here's how you pull off air juggles. Here's how you get the ball on top of your roof and dribble with it. Here's how you shoot from three quarters of the way up the wall. You'd just be saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just want to know which button makes the car jump again. Is it it A? Right? Uh, The more advanced stuff, it's too much for you to take in right away. It'd be too much to assimilate, too much to try and duplicate. Now, I mean, you'll probably get it eventually. Your understanding and skills will improve just by playing the game and learning the mechanics. And the longer you play and the more you stick with it, the more success you'll naturally have. And of course, the effort you put into it also has something to do with what you get out of it. But when you first start off, you need to have only a few things to focus on and you need to keep those things as simple as possible. And that's why I gave our youth only three things to start. Three things to start with, but there's ten things every church member must do. Just going to keep doing the clickbait title because I like it. And just so you know, I didn't make this list up. You can find these things in the second part of Acts chapter 2. It's a list composed of the actions of the first church. And like Rocket League skills, there are levels and nuance to each of these items on the list. So just be aware that each and every church and each and every church member moves at their own pace and has their own methods of accomplishing the various entries on this list. So no matter where you're at or how you're doing with any of these things, don't get discouraged. Just keep that in mind as we go through this list. So our list will begin in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. But first, let's set the stage. It's still the day of Pentecost, like we talked about last week. The Holy Spirit has settled on the apostles and believers, and they've shared through a miracle news about the good things that God has done in the original languages of everybody listening, which was quite a diverse group. And then after being challenged, Peter and the 11 other apostles step up, and Peter shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. He testifies as an eyewitness to Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and lordship as the promised Messiah. And it says in verse 37 that Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And if you keep reading, there's much more to come, but let's just stop right there. The number one thing that every church member must do Repent of your sins and turn to God. It's the first thing on the list. And according to the book of Matthew chapter 4, it's the first recorded thing that Jesus preached. He said, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. So it's no wonder that if it's the first thing that Jesus preached, it's the first thing on Peter's list for the new church. Repentance and turning to God has always been a part of the relationship between God and man. Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. The prophets preached repentance. Even the book of Proverbs has excellent wisdom about repentance. And since this has been the biggest part of the equation of humans following after God since ancient times, this, this idea for the need for repentance and then where we turn after we repent, it's telling about the nature of man and the nature of God. And I'm sure it's not unfamiliar. And we talk about the relationship between mankind and sin and God almost every Sunday, if not every Sunday. And I'll let the Apostle Paul sum that relationship up because he puts it so succinctly in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm a human, sinful person. I am not perfect. Far from it. I'm going to mess up. I struggle with sin nature. Not even because I want to, but because I'm not God And I'm not perfect. My way of thinking is not the best all the time. And some choices that I make and some actions that I perform, even some reactions that are more knee-jerk, more instinctual than premeditated, 
Some of those will lead me to hurt other people or hurt myself or drive wedges between me and others or drive wedges between me and God. And some of the things that I do might not even register with me, but they would not live up to best practices if that best practices document was authored by God. So I fall short. We fall short. God is perfect. In him, there is no sin. Jesus, God's son, with the full power of God as well, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, he's the only one to walk this earth to never sin. And in Jesus, we have the shining example of how we should live. It's a clear picture. If I want a better relationship with God, if I want to live more closely to the purpose I was created for, I need to turn to Jesus and follow his clear example of how to live. And and I think that plays into the nature of repentance and our relationship with God. Uh, As I have heard repentance described many times to me by church leaders and teachers, repent means to turn away from. So I turn away from my sinful behavior, but then I'm not just wandering aimlessly, wondering what to do. I turn to God. And the bridge between God and man is obviously Jesus Christ. So I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus to learn a better way. But as I I was studying about repentance and listening to what a lot of people had to say about it and reading about what a lot of people had to say about it, it seemed to me that there's some confusion for some people as to what repentance really is and everything that it entails. And I learned kind of a new dimension in repentance that I hadn't heard before, and I wanted to share that with you too. But first, I wanted to clear up the confusion that I found. Repentance is not a feeling of guilt. Now, guilt may naturally accompany your change in behavior. Most of us are going to have a moment where we feel bad about the things that we've done, especially if we've hurt others. But that feeling of guilt is not repentance. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to liberate us from our sin. And while some guilt may even be healthy in certain situations, when it leads to us making amends with those who we've hurt, or or it acts as kind of a, a stimulus for behavioral change, some people take the guilt thing too far. I was reading stories of people who felt that even though they had grasped new life in Jesus when they first turned to him, that they felt that they had to go back and feel the weight of all the bad decisions they had made in life and the sins that they had committed. And for some of us who have lived on this planet for a while now, wow, that could add up to a lot of guilt, crushing, suffocating amounts of guilt. I read this one story that broke my heart. Somebody else who mistakenly confused guilt for repentance. There was this mother and she was raising her kids and she had it in her mind that unless her kids showed guilt and cried after they had done something wrong, that it wasn't true repentance because they must not have felt bad enough about it. So when her kids messed up, even if they apologized, she would scold them and shame them until they cried. That is heartbreaking. The history of the world is filled with stories of shame and tears and guilt that have not led to changed behavior. Guilt does not always lead to repentance. Neither does conviction. Just the recognition that you've done something wrong. That does not always lead to repentance. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 2.4. He says, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And the New Living Translation of that verse says this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? And once again, there's that relationship between Repentance, turning from our sins, and turning to a God whose kindness and mercy 
and love and patience are intended to turn us from our sin, not guilt and shame and punishment and condemnation. There's one more thing about repentance that I think is important to understand. Repentance is not just changing your behavior, it's changing your mind. In fact, your behavior changes because your mind has been changed. Uh, The closest literal translation of the Greek word that's used in this passage for repent means to have a change of mind or to reconsider afterward. Well, reconsider after what? In the way that it's used here, a, a possible good definition would be to say changing your mind after being with. And there's no way to prove what I'm about to say. This is all just how an individual reads the passage and what they take away from it. But I'll tell you what I took away that I've never taken away before. And if you don't like it and, you know, you don't think it's accurate, you can disregard it. But if you do like it, you can have it for free. I think that the repentance that is mentioned here and talked about elsewhere in Scripture, in the New Testament, is to change your mind after being with Jesus or being around Jesus. And since like most of these people that Peter is addressing at the formation of the early church, we've not gotten the chance at this point in our lives to meet Jesus face to face. Our being around Jesus is probably more accurately described as being with or around the presence of his Holy Spirit. These new believers that Peter is addressing. Not only have they heard Peter make a case for Jesus using personal testimony in scripture, which I think is safe to say was a spirit-led sharing, but they've also seen up close and personal the power of the Holy Spirit when they witnessed the tongues of fire and the many languages miracle, which is probably still going uh, uh, while Peter is replying here in Acts. There's no reason to believe that, you know, if Peter had a multilingual audience and the Spirit was allowing all of these different languages uh, to be heard, that suddenly that would stop now and he'd need a translator for the what must we do part. Long story short, I would say that repentance is changing your mind after being with or around the Holy Spirit. Just my opinion. I could be wrong. We could say this in a lot of ways. After experiencing the Holy Spirit, after encountering the Holy Spirit, after being affected by the Holy Spirit. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is not only the catalyst for true spiritual repentance, but it's also the power behind it. There's a a famous verse in Romans that gets quoted all the time. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And that's probably the version that most of us are familiar with. But here's a translation that's apropos for our discussion today. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If repentance is changing your mind or changing the way we think, and Romans 12, 2 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, then I can't help but see a symbiotic relationship between the concept and action of repentance and the person of the Holy Spirit. And the good news is that once we come to repentance, we're not left alone to transform and change our way of life on our own. We spent some time last year talking about the fruits of the Spirit, as outlined in Galatians chapter 5. Fruits of the Spirit being attributes that the Apostle Paul says the Holy Spirit produces in the lives of believers. And Paul says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If there is true repentance, then there will be transformation. And that transformation is not produced solely under our own power. It's a product of the Holy Spirit 
working in our lives and us doing our best to walk with Jesus and trying to live more like him. But for true transformation to take place, we need the Holy Spirit. We need those fruits. We need patience and peace and goodness and self-control, just to name a few, to change the way you live. God calls us to repent, to turn from our sins and turn to Jesus, to learn how to live and change our lives and our behaviors accordingly. But he's not going to leave us high and dry. In Ephesians 4, Paul writes this, Since you've learned about Jesus and the truth that comes from him, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. When we are approached, nudged, tapped on the shoulder, or even shaken by God's Holy Spirit, Whenever the Holy Spirit confronts us with our need for Jesus and pierces our heart with its power, if we choose repentance, then that same Holy Spirit will power our transformation and see us down the road of sanctification and make sure that our repentance leads to redemption and rejoicing. And that's why the first thing that every church member must do, every believer that is a part of the global body of Christ, Repent of your sins and turn to God. All right, one down, nine to go. How are we doing on time? <laughs> Kidding. Um, I don't know why or how I thought I was actually going to be able to go through all 10 of these in one message like I originally did. So it looks like we've got ourselves a little mini series here. But before we go, I'm going to try and get one more of the 10 things in here. Um, with your permission, I'm going to go a little out of order. Uh, Acts 2.46 says that these believers that would form the early church met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper, also known today as communion, is something that we do as a church body on the first Sunday of every month. And since we're taking communion together today, it seemed like the perfect time to talk about it. So the Lord's Supper, or communion is what we consider to be one of the two ordinances of the church, at least in this church. Uh, now, there's a lot of different ways that people define ordinances. Uh, they could be defined as a religious rite or practice associated with tangible elements celebrated by the church. So in the case of communion, the tangible elements are the bread and the wine. An additional definition of ordinance is a religious ritual intended to demonstrate an adherence faith. Which is why when we take communion, we add the caveat that anyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus is welcome to take the elements with us. Now, you may hear ordinances referred to as sacraments in certain religious traditions, and there may be a lot more of them. And the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance is the belief of what's behind them and what's happening during the ceremony. So churches who subscribe to sacraments often see these rituals as being a means or a vehicle of God's grace. So in other words, as a worshiper performs this rite, they receive a divine blessing, either in terms of salvation or sanctification or some other divine gift. Now, an ordinance is typically understood to be a practice commanded to be performed by the Lord. And we would say that the grace and gifting from God has already been bestowed as a result of putting our trust in Jesus Christ, repenting and turning to Jesus. And that the grace of the Lord is ever flowing, always being bestowed on believers as the Lord desires for his purpose or for our benefits, not as the result of the completion of a ritual or act. Now, some religious traditions see the sacraments as being necessary for salvation, but that's not what we see in scripture, and it's not what Jesus said, nor his apostles. Uh, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, the apostle Paul states, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. It doesn't say openly declaring and believing in your heart 
and performing the sacraments or ordinances. But we'll talk a little bit more about the differences in beliefs next week. But at Seacoast, we believe that while they are important because we were called to perform these acts by the Lord, they're better understood as symbolic reenactments or remembrances of the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, In Luke 22, Jesus and the disciples are sharing the meal that would come to be known as the Last Supper, the last dinner together with Jesus before the events leading to Jesus' crucifixion take place. And in Luke 22, 17, we're told, Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And there it is. The command from Jesus to his disciples, making this an ordinance to have the Lord's supper in remembrance of him. And we further understand that this is meant to be a repeatable ordinance that the believers would continue to come back to and perform, not just reserved exclusively for the 12 disciples. And the way that we know that is by reading passages like Acts 2 and also Paul's reiteration and explanation of the ordinance to another group of believers in 1 Corinthians 11. But before we say anything else, let's just finish the passage in Luke 22. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. When we take communion, we are remembering and reflecting on the goodness of a Lord and Savior who sacrificed his body and poured out his blood to pay the price for our sins. I'm incapable of paying the price for my own sins because I'm a sinner. It's the same reason I can't pay for yours. It's the same reason you can't pay for mine. It's that sin that we all have that separated us from a holy God. But as Jesus himself says in John 3.16, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus the only person to walk this earth who never sinned, fully God, fully man, laid down his own life so we could have eternal life and abundant life. Forgiveness from our sins and a restored relationship with our heavenly father. And Jesus proved his power over life, death, and the grave when he rose from the grave three days after being crucified. So we know that when Jesus says in John 14, I am going to prepare a place for you, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. We know that Jesus is capable of keeping that promise. There's one particular aspect of communion that sometimes I think we forget about. When we take the elements, we're not only giving thanks for and reflecting on and remembering the death of Jesus Christ for our sake, but we're also looking forward to and remembering the fact that Jesus is coming again, just like he promised. Uh, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And so it goes without saying, that the next thing on our list that every church member must do is remember the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that in just a few moments. And during that time, it's also a good time to reflect on our own lives, how we're doing in our walk with Jesus, to ask ourselves, do we have any unconfessed sin that we need to repent of, to ask the Lord to examine our hearts and show us if there's anything we need to lay down or leave behind, if there's a relationship that needs mending. And it's also the perfect time to ask the Lord to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We said that repentance was helped along by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we have to do on our own. But it is possible that sometime between that first recognition of our need for repentance and that first time that we turn to the Lord and now that we may have slipped into sin by going our own way or relying on our own power instead of the power of God's Holy Spirit. I've said this before. 
And I believe this. I believe the entirety of a Christian's life is meant to be a life of repentance. And when we get off track and go our own way, sometimes an ordinance like communion, where we remember God's goodness, can be a good reminder that it's time to repent and turn to the Lord once again. So if you're sitting here today or you're watching online and you've never put your faith or trust in Jesus, if you never asked for forgiveness of your sins, you've never turned to Jesus to be the Lord of your life, today's the perfect time. And if you want to do that, you can do that right now and receive forgiveness and the gift of eternal life and abundant life, true meaning and purpose. And at the same time, receiving the power of God's Holy Spirit. And then you'll be ready to share your first communion with us as a member of the body of Christ here today. So if that's you today and you would like to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life, would you pray this prayer right after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong things. Please forgive me of my sins. Right now, I ask you to be my personal savior. Be the Lord of my life. Lord, help me to turn from my sins and follow you. I thank you for dying on the cross. I thank you for rising again three days later and taking my sins away. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for preparing a place for me up in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer today, um, I want to tell you how happy I am for you. And I, I want to tell you that while the Christian life is one of repentance, Scripture tells us that no one can pluck you from the Father's hand. So once you have come to Jesus, your eternal life in Jesus is secure thanks to the freedom that he bought for all of us on the cross. Right now, we're going to remember that sacrifice as a church. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, everyone who has put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ are welcome to take communion with us. So our volunteers are going to pass out the elements, and then we're all going to hold on to them as the worship team leads us in another song. And like I said, during that time, it's a great time to reflect and to remember and to talk to God. And when the song is over, I'll come back, we'll pray together again, and then we'll take the elements together.
sacrifice for us. Lord, create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us. Uh, Lord, we come to you asking that your spirit would show us how to live, Lord, when we leave this place. And um, Lord, we just, we give our lives to you and we thank you. Let's remember his body broken for us. blood that he shed for the forgiveness of sins. And all God's grateful people said, amen. amen. All right. So it's so the first thing every church member must do. Repent and turn to God. Yes. And what was the next one on our list from today? Remember the Lord's Supper or communion. This is easy, folks. I expected to hear more back from you. It's going to get tougher. There's eight more on the list that we will fill in over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'll be talking about our second ordinance next week. Um, in the meantime, if you need next steps, if you like prayer for anything, if there's a way that we can help you out, we've got a prayer chain, we've got a care team, we've got a group of Christ followers who love God and love people. So just let us know how we can help. You can always come and see me after the service, or if you're not on campus or you just prefer a different way, uh, give me an email. My email is josh at seacostredondo.com. Uh, next week is the Super Bowl, right? And can I say that, or do I have to say the big game? I don't know. Am I going to get sued? Let's have some fun. Wear your favorite team's jersey if you want, and come on into church next week. No heckling people wearing team jerseys that aren't yours. Be nice. 
And I promise I will have you out of here in time for kickoff. You won't even miss the pre-pre-pre show. (laughs) So until then, may you always feel the Holy Spirit drawing you closer to God and turning you toward the path you should follow. And may we always live in communion with Christ and one another. God bless you. Take a look at the screens.